So, now we are going to come to the famous Satipatthana Sutta. And uh, we did a workshop here in Perth quite recently about the uh, uh, Satipatthana practice in general. And uh, I discussed the Satipatthana Sutta in quite a bit of detail. And I will discuss some of those things with you here as well on this little retreat, because I think some of these ideas will make it more clear what meditation really is about and how it actually works. So we want to understand the Satipatthana Sutta in the right way here. There's lots of teachings about the Satipatthana Sutta. And one of the first things to realize about Satipatthana is that if you want to understand Satipatthana Sutta, or if you want to understand Satipatthana in general, it is not enough just to read one sutta. You cannot just read the Satipatthana Sutta and think you will understand about meditation practice. What you have to do is you have to read a large range of suttas, all dealing with Satipatthana, then you can understand how this practice actually works. And this is a very useful thing to understand because then we can we gain the large picture of what is going on. And one aspect of that large picture, which I've been talking about a lot, is the idea of it needs to be supported by sila and right view. In fact, it needs to be supported by the rest of the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah? The first six factors of the Noble Eightfold Path are the supports for Satipatthana practice. Satipatthana is factor number seven. All the other factors come before that. The six other factors come before that. Only Samadhi comes afterwards. So all of these things, you can only know them by reading other places in the suttas, because these things are not mentioned specifically in the Satipatthana Sutta. But let us focus now on the Satipatthana Sutta itself. And this is how it starts out. Yeah? So I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Kurus near the Kuru town named Kamasadhamma. There the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants or monks, venerable sir, they replied. And the Buddha said this. So we have the setting here. You will notice that now we are not in Savati, we are somewhere else. This is quite, uh, usually the suttas are in Savati, it's very common. But here we are in the land of the Kurus. And uh, this is like a quite a far away place. The Kuru country is close to what is New Delhi. If you go to India and you go to New Delhi, this is roughly the area of the Kurus. And this is an ancient stronghold of the Brahmins. The Brahmins used to live in this area and they have the city called the Kurukshetra. And Kurukshetra has been actually discovered through archeological evidence. So these are real places, yeah? These are real places that the Buddhists are talking about. So this is where the Buddha talked about this sutta. It is kind of interesting that the sutta was taught, uh, taught in this place, but uh, I won't go too much into that because otherwise we're going to go too far astray from the main content of the sutta. So let's um, carry on. So the Buddha then says, mendicants or monastics, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, this is the four satipatthanas, are the path to convergence. They are in order to purify sentient beings, to get past sorrow and crying, to make an end of pain and sadness, to end the cycle of suffering, to realize extinguishment. Extinguishment is Nibbana. So uh, the uh, purpose of this statement at the very beginning of the Satipatthana Sutta is to show that if you practice Satipatthana in the right way, then the ultimate goal of Satipatthana is to achieve awakening. Yeah, it is to go to all the way to the end of the path. This is the purpose. Going past sorrow and crying and all of these things, well, that, this is what extinguishment is about. It's about the overcoming of suffering. So for this reason, it is very interesting, right? But uh, one of the strange things is that if you look at the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, one of the things that you will see on the Noble Eightfold Path is that Satipatthana always leads to 
Samma Samadhi. It always leads to the jhanas, right? You have the seventh factor, which is Satipatthana, right mindfulness. And then you have the eighth factor, which is right Samadhi. That is the four jhanas. So we, in the sutta, Satipatthana always lead to the four jhanas. Here, it is said to lead to awakening. So how do we join these things together? And the way to join these things together is to understand that if you practice Satipatthana all the way, if you practice Satipatthana fully and in every conceivable way, well, then you include the jhana states within Satipatthana practice. Yeah, that is how you understand it. So there is the ordinary way of practicing Satipatthana, which is just mindfulness of breathing. And that ordinary way of practice, practicing Satipatthana leads to the jhana states. But then there is the expanded way of, of, of practicing Satipatthana. And that expanded way actually includes the jhanas within it. And then it does lead to Nibbana. And it leads to the end of all suffering as a consequence. So this is um, how to understand this in the right way here. You will also notice there the uh, little phrase, the path to convergence. Yeah, this is kind of an unusual way of uh, translating. Translating This is the, uh, in the Pali, this is called the Ekayano Mango. Huh? And uh, it is one of those phrases that it has been, many people have been arguing over what this actually means. Uh, but this here is the translation here is from Bhante Sujato, and he translated as the path to convergence, uh, which is a very interesting translation. And the meaning of that uh, is that Satipatthana, when practiced in the right way, it leads to the convergence of the mind. And the convergence of the mind, what is that? It is samadhi. It is the jhana states. Uh, yeah? So he's saying here that, first of all, mindfulness meditation leads to jhana, then in the next sentence, then it carries on and it leads all the way to Nibbana as, a, uh, as the final result. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting argument. Uh, uh, and I think maybe uh, that he may be right about that. Uh, and it's a very interesting translation that he has there. So this is the background for the Satipatthana. Yes, yeah? so and now we're coming to the meditation proper. How does the Buddha teach this meditation? so that it leads all the way to awakening. Yeah. And um, to start out, uh, we come to the uh, uh, short description of Satipatthana practice. Yeah? And this is like the short statement. Uh, and then we come to the expanded version of Satipatthana practice afterwards. Uh. So let's first of all have a look at this short version of Satipatthana. So what for, in other words, what for uh, Satipatthanas? Uh, it is when a mendicant, yeah, a monastic, this also includes lay people. Remember the lay people will often be in the audience as well, but the monastics are considered more senior, so it is spoken to the monastics. Uh, it is when anyone meditates uh, by observing an aspect of the body, keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. This is a very interesting sentence because this gives you a lot of information about how the meditation is supposed to happen. Yeah? So it starts off by saying, meditates, viharati. So viharati here, this Pali word, in this case, it means to meditate. Yeah? In this case, it is perfectly acceptable translation. Viharati, then you have the idea of observing, yeah, observing an aspect of the body. The Pali word for observing is anupasi. And quite literally, what it means, it means something like seeing along with, yeah, kind of following along with the body. Yeah. And as I was saying before, it is important to understand here that when we use a term like kaya kaya anupasi, anupasi does not always mean just simply observing. Sometimes it may imply an act of imagination. Sometimes it is an inference. Yeah? You look at something and because you see something in a certain way, you understand the larger reality, the larger consequences of something. So translating as observing is okay, but you could also translate it as contemplating. Yeah? 
And when you translate as contemplating, in a sense, it is perhaps more accurate because when you contemplate, it means that there is more, is more than just watching something. There is an involvement, mental involvement as well. And that mental involvement, as I just said, may mean things like using your imagination. Yeah? In other words, on the 31 parts of the body, for example, using your imagination on that or inferring something. Yeah? After you come out of your meditation, you think back to your meditation. What actually happened? That is when the insight can happen after the fact. That is why it is called inference, because it's not while you are observing, but it's happening afterwards. So I think contemplation in many ways is maybe a better translation here. There are ways in which observing is correct as well. So for example, if you are watching the breath, yeah, if, if that is your meditation, well, if you're watching the breath, well then, of course, the idea of, of observing is most powerful because watching the breath, there is no need for imagination. There is no need for inference. You're just observing exactly what it is like. Yeah? So it depends a little bit on the context, exactly what is meant. So both observing and contemplating can be right, depending a little bit on the context that we are dealing with. Then you have the idea of an aspect of the body. Yeah, this is kaya, kaya nupasi. It is this kind of strange uh, way that this is explained, this is um, expressed in the Pali, kaya is in the body. So you are literally, it says you are observing a body in the body. What do you mean observing a body in the body? What is that supposed to mean? <laughs> and what it means is that the, the body is a very complex thing. There are many aspects, many different ways of looking at this body. You can look at it from different angles. Yeah? You can look at it, for example, from the point of view of the breath. And the breath is like a body in the body. Does that make any sense? Well, I will show you later on why that makes sense. It makes sense because that is what the Buddha says. The Buddha says this when you come to the Anapanasati Sutta later on, the Sutta on mindfulness of breathing, the Buddha literally says the breath is a body among bodies. Because remember, we're not dealing with the literal physical body. We're using the body as a sum of phenomena. So you have a sum of phenomena. The breath is called the body because it, it consists of all possible breaths. And because it consists of that, it is a sum of phenomena. It is called a body. It is called a conglomeration of things in its own right. So this is how it works. The idea of body here is not as specific as you might think it is. So it is an aspect of the body, yeah? The breath, maybe the 31 parts, 31 parts is like a particular way of looking at the body, or it is the four elements maybe, which also is a particular way of looking at the body. So I think this is a very good translation here, an aspect of the body. Sometimes, traditionally, this is translated into English as something like, uh, they contemplate uh, uh, the body as a body. They contemplate a body as a body. And it sounds kind of strange. Why don't you just say contemplate the body? What's the point of saying the body as a body? And it is much more hard to really understand what is going on when you translate in that way. But this here is a very transparent kind of translation. Everyone can understand what is going on in this case. And that's why it is a nice translation in my opinion. So you observe an aspect of the body. How do you do that? How do you do that observation? And this is the next part here. It shows you how you do it. Keen, aware, and mindful. And these Pali words, keen is the word is atapi. And atapi means like, it's as if you have, you're coming to this with a degree of a, interest with a degree of effort with a degree of energy yeah? yeah and what you find in the suttas is that you know when you think about satipatthana practice it's the seventh factor of the noble eightfold path right mindfulness before that you have right effort after that you have right samadhi it's in between when we talk about right effort we always talk about padana yeah we are making an effort to be able to purify the mind. 
When it comes to samadhi, we're not talking about effort anymore. The effort has changed into energy. Yeah? Yeah? Energy is not the same as effort. Energy is what naturally occurs in the mind. When you feel energized, you feel bright, you feel the energy within that. Yeah? So we are moving from making an actual effort to reaching the state where we are naturally energetic. Yeah? One is right effort, the other one is samadhi. And in between that is mindfulness. So, yeah, in between that is this word atapi. So the word atapi covers the idea of a little bit of effort, but also a little bit of energy. Yeah, it kind of covers both of those. We are moving from effort to energy. Yeah? And this is why the idea of keen is quite nice, yeah? Because keen implies the idea of being inspired about something. You are keen, yeah, this is inspiring, yeah? And when you are inspired about something, yeah, that means that you, that means that you have a degree of energy, yeah? If you are inspired to do something, it means the energy comes naturally, yeah? But keen also probably applies a little bit, implies a little bit of, actively using your effort to apply yourself. So keen is this kind of middle ground where you feel inspired, but you're also applying the mind a little bit. This kind of the idea here. Yeah? This is how you do this observation. Ideally, we want to do it only with energy, but in the early stages, you also need to apply yourself a little bit. That is really what it is saying here. Then we have the word aware, and the word aware is sampajano. This is related to the word idea of sampajanya that we have talked about before. Uh, when we talked about it before, uh, we were saying that it can be translated as situational awareness, uh, also as full awareness or clear comprehension. Yeah? And the idea here in the Satipatthana Sutta, we are dealing with a higher kind of Sampajanya. Before we were talking about having clear awareness of, or situational awareness, when you are going into the village, you're coming back, when you're going to the toilet, when you're eating, when you are in regard to sleeping and all of these kind of things. But here it is different because here we are dealing with meditation proper. And because we're dealing with meditation proper, it's a different kind of clear awareness. So what, what it means here is that we know what we are doing. What it means here is that we know that we are placing our awareness on the meditation object. It means that we are keeping our attention on the meditation object. We're not losing track of the meditation object. It, it notices whether we are making progress or not. Yeah? We are aware of what is going on, whether the meditation is working or not. This is the idea here of clear awareness. Then we have the very important word mindful. Yeah? Doing this meditation requires mindfulness. This is a very interesting point because you will have noticed that sometimes Satipatthana is translated as the foundation of mindfulness. But if something is translated as the foundation of mindfulness, it sounds as if we become mindful by doing this practice. This practice leads to mindfulness. But actually, no, it says right here that you have to be mindful to do this practice. You have to be mindful first. And then when you are mindful, then you can do this practice. So we have, to, again, it's important here to get the sequence right, yeah? And when we have the sequence right, then the meditation will work. Yeah? And you shall, we shall see later on when we come to the Anapanasati Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing, it is exactly the same thing. The beginning of the Anapanasati Sutta, it says that you establish mindfulness. And only when you have established mindfulness, do you practice the mindfulness of breathing. Yeah? You have to get the sequence right. First of all, establishing mindfulness. So how do we establish mindfulness? Well, the way you establish mindfulness is through the first six factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Right view, right conduct, yeah? especially right effort. When we do right effort, what we are doing is that we are overcoming in the large part the defilements of the mind. We are overcoming excessive anger and excessive greed. And by overcoming those things through 
right effort, then mindfulness is one of the consequences of that. Yeah, so mindfulness needs to be established before really we do this kind of meditation. And this is why you will notice that every time we do the guided meditation, I always start off by establishing mindfulness, allowing things to calm down, coming into the present, being aware of what is going on. Then you can start watching the breath. Then we can start to do meditation proper. Mindfulness has to come first. So I only I try here to follow the instructions of the Buddha as closely as I can. And then we have the very last part here, rid of desire and aversion for the world. And uh, that is a, also a very interesting phrase. Um, I, <laughs> we're kind of running out of time a little bit. Let me... Let me just stop there. We can talk about that phrase afterward. But what that phrase is very, very briefly, so you have an idea how it relates to the rest of this. Uh, rid of desire and aversion, this means overcoming the coarse defilements in the mind yeah, that relate to the world outside, the five sense world. Uh, and that fits in with the idea of being mindful, because to be able to be mindful, you have to get rid of these coarse defilements. Uh, then the meditation really takes off. I'll talk about this in a bit more detail when we come back again later on. But uh, for now, let us just do another. So in the world, in this kind of context, seems to me in the world of the five senses, the ordinary world that we are in. So you're rid of desire in that world and aversion in that world. Aversion means rejecting things in that world. It's like the opposite of desire. Yeah? Desire, the opposite of desire is not ill will. The opposite is aversion, is the pushing away. It's something you don't like because it's, uh, you don't want to have anything to do with it. And what is interesting about this expression, abhijja dormanasa, uh, which it is in the Pali language, is that it is also found in the four right efforts. Uh, yeah? In the four right efforts, it's, it's said that you, uh, you have the, uh, uh, the mindfulness and, and the awareness and you restrain the five, six faculties uh, in such a way as to avoid the desire and aversion that we're talking about here. The same expression, abhijja domanasa, that is found in the four right efforts. Uh, so the point here is that in the four right efforts, uh, you overcome this problem. That is the job of the four right efforts is to overcome desire and aversion. Uh, and then when you come to Satipatthana, you have overcome it. That's why it says rid of desire and aversion. Yeah, because you have already overcome it uh, during the um, uh, previous step on the path, which is the four right efforts. Uh, so here you are rid, so you can see how it is structured, yeah? how, how the one thing leading to the next one, the same wording is being used. In one place, you are actively overcoming it. In the next instance, when you come to the meditation, which is here, then you have overcome it because you did that job uh, previously, uh, during the previous uh, uh, step of the path. Uh, so this now gives you a, a kind of a nice idea what the mind of someone doing meditation is supposed to be like. Yeah, these are the mental aspects. So first of all, rid of desire and aversion for the world means that you have subdued the kind of obvious desires and aversions in regard to that world. There may still be some very subtle desires left. It doesn't mean that you are completely rid of desire, but it is largely subdued. It is subdued so that you are able to be mindful. The mind is no longer running around into the past and the future and all of these kind of things. It is fairly stable. So this is a necessary prerequisite for mindfulness to be possible. You cannot be mindful and have a lot of desire and aversion because desire and aversion pull the mind out of the present. It's impossible to stay in the present if desire is very strong. The same thing with aversion. So it is a natural, naturally goes together with mindfulness. Yeah, so this gives you an idea of whether you are ready for meditation or not. It gives you an idea what you have to do in terms of calming down and relaxing at the beginning of meditation. You have to clear the mind of these kind of problems for mindfulness to arise. 
And then you have the idea of being keen. Yeah? Keen here means that you have a degree of energy in the mind. The mind is not too sluggish or anything like that, but it has a sense of energy to it, a willingness to do the meditation. That is when uh, this meditation becomes possible. Yeah? So these are handy little pin uh, pointers uh, towards what kind of mind state uh, is able to do the meditation practice. So let's look at the, um, uh, the next three, the coming up straight away. Yeah? So the first one is about the body. The next one is uh, you meditate observing an aspect of feelings. Uh, keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Uh, yeah? So this is the aspect of feelings. Uh, and uh, this is basically the kind of... Um, whether the experience is happy, unhappy, or neutral. Yeah? And it, you will notice here, it is an aspect of feeling. It is not all feelings. Uh, there tends to be only one feeling at the time, uh, and then you focus on that particular feeling. Yeah? Now, an important point here is that we are moving. Yeah, remember everything in Buddhism is structured. Uh, everything has a sequence. Uh, the sequence is never random. So body comes first, then comes feelings. Uh, yeah? And we shall see later on when we come to the Anapanasati Sutta, the idea of mindfulness of breathing, why this is the natural sequence. Uh, the feelings here are generally positive feelings uh, that arise out of meditation practice by focusing on the breath. Uh, and you focus on one aspect of those feelings uh, yeah, at the time, because when we meditate, things tend to move slowly. One feeling is usually present. When you feel bliss, you don't usually feel the other feelings, etc. So an aspect of feeling here. Then you meditate observing an aspect of the mind, keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. So again, the mind can be understood as having many different aspects to it. Yeah, there can be mind that is a beautiful and elevated and clear and, and, and kind of really large and expanded. Uh, there can be mind which is really contracted. Uh, there can be mind which has all kinds of defilements to it. Uh, and there can be the mind which is free of these defilements. Uh, and then you are aware of these different aspects of the mind. Uh, and again, there is a natural sequence here. So the mind contemplation usually comes after the feeling contemplation. It is getting more and more profound as we move forward. And again, we'll see how this works out once we get to the mindfulness of breathing later on. And then we have the last one. You meditate observing an aspect of principles, keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Yeah, so principles here is really... The, the, the Pali word is a Dhamma, and it can be understood as phenomena, that you contemplate on phenomena, but it can also be understood as understanding causality in Buddhism, because the idea of causality is very important. So it then means we understand why the defilements are present, for example, what are the causes that bring them around. And when we understand causality, then if you do something with the cause, then of course, you also do something with the result. So for this reason, it is very useful uh, to have an idea of causality here. So this is the uh, introductory paragraph to the Satipatthana Sutta. And if you uh, want to know about Satipatthana, this is maybe the most important part of the entire Satipatthana Sutta. This is the part which is found throughout the suttas. Uh, whenever you read the suttas broadly, you go to the uh, Sangyuta Nikaya, the connected discourses, you find the Satipatthana Sangyuta, that is all the discourses on Satipatthana practice uh, collected in one place, 50 discourses. This is what you see. This paragraph is the significant one. Uh, so this is the standard way that Satipatthana is explained in the suttas. Uh, and because it is the standard way, you can take it that it is the most meaningful aspect or part uh, of the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah, so um, quite important. Now, of course, the Satipatthana Sutta itself has much more content. We're going to now have a quick look at the content of the Satipatthana Sutta. And this is actually quite interesting here, because what we're going to do now, we're going to do an analysis of this content. 
And we want to, one of the things that I have always been very interested in my monastic life, that is, what did the Buddha actually teach? Yeah, and can we be 100% reliant on just reading the suttas, or, or do we have to investigate a bit more deeply? Yeah. This is kind of one of those very interesting questions to ask. Yeah. And one of the things about the Satipatthana Sutta, which is particularly fascinating, is that when you compare the different versions of the Satipatthana Sutta, and by different versions I mean the Sutta belonging to different schools of Buddhism, just to give you a little bit of background so you can understand what I'm talking about, uh, the way the history of Buddhism is such that uh, not so long after the Buddha passed away, say 200 years after the Buddha passed away, around the time of Ashoka, maybe only 150 years, 200 years, uh, the Buddhism started to split up. It started to go to different parts of India. So you had the what is now the Theravada Buddhism went to Sri Lanka, yeah, and became established in, the, in Sri Lanka and has been there ever since. Uh, other schools went to the north of India. So there were uh, the monks who went to the north, they eventually became the forefathers of the Sarvastivadan school of Buddhism, a very important school of Buddhism. Another school that went to the north of India went a little bit further north, a little bit further west to Gandhara, present day Afghanistan and Pakistan and these things. Uh, they become known as the Dharmaguptaka school. Yeah? And then in central India, around uh, where Buddhism started out, all the schools were present to some extent, including the Mahasangika. The Mahasangika was another very important school of early Buddhism. Those are some of the most important ones. There are other ones as well, uh, Puglavada school, for example, and uh, a whole host, 18 schools is usually counted at the beginning. But of those 18, only a few are really important and significant. So what happened when the Sangha dispersed in this way, they established separate schools. And after a while, those schools would start to create their own understanding of the Buddhist teachings, right? The Sarvastivadan schools would have their commentaries and how they understand the teaching. The Theravada would have their commentaries and how they understood the teachings. Mahasangika would have their understanding of how to understand the suttas. And so gradually they became a little bit different. Yeah, and they started to think about the uh, suttas in different ways. Uh, and because they kept the suttas independent of each other, yeah, the Sarvastivadins, they would recite the suttas together with other Sarvastivadins. The Theravadins would recite the suttas together with other Theravadins. Uh, because they were kept apart like this, even the suttas started to differ a little bit. Uh, and what we know from that history is that there were things added to the suttas. Sometimes they would add things because it just seemed natural. Yeah, it seemed kind of reasonable to add things, not because they wanted to destroy anything or they wanted to damage Buddhism, but simply because they thought it was natural to add. And what is interesting here, one of the suttas that had been added to the most seems to be the Satipatthana Sutta which is kind of astonishing when you think about it, because Satipatthana Sutta is taken to be so important in Theravada Buddhism. It's like the core idea of what the Buddha taught. This is the pristine teaching of the Buddha going all the way back to uh, you know, the time of the Buddha himself. But actually, that is not the case at all. Satipatthana Sutta is one of the most chained suttas, probably in the whole Pali Canon. And one of the reasons for that is because it is very easy to add to the Satipatthana Sutta. Satipatthana Sutta, it, it comes in blocks. And because it comes in blocks, it is very easy to add new blocks in there and blocks that seem as if they belong there. It seems reasonable to add these things, right? So what I want to discuss now is I want to, uh, as we go through this, we have already looked at most of these exercises already in the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta, the mindfulness to the body. What I want to look at now is see if we can discern a little bit more about what is the original Satipatthana Sutta. And as we do that, uh, one of the results of doing all of that, I can tell you the result in advance, just to make things life more easy for you. Don't have to be too worried. Uh, the result in advance is that uh, Basically, Satipatthana mainly is about one thing. It is about mindfulness of breathing. 
That is the main thing that Satipatthana is about. The Satipatthana is just one way of thinking about the process of mindfulness of breathing here. It's a little bit more than that, but that is kind of the essence of Satipatthana practice. So this is kind of nice, right? It makes it very simple and we can understand what is going on. So how do we arrive at that conclusion? So to see this, we will start with the observing the body or contemplating the body. This is called Kaya Nupasana. And uh, we will, uh, uh, so, so let's see what comes up here. I can't remember exactly what comes up. Okay, so what comes up here is precisely this comparative study. So we're going to look at observing the body and we're going to look at which parts of observing the body are found in the different schools, yeah? So remember in the Pali Satipatthana Sutta, observing the body has six parts to it. First of all, you have the mindfulness of breathing, yeah? Then you have the four postures. Then you have the situational awareness or clear comprehension, number three. Then you have the 31 parts of the body, number four. Then you have the four elements, number five. And then finally, you have the cemetery contemplation. So there's six kind of ways of doing the body contemplation according to the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah? So how many of these are found in other schools or in other systems? This is what we want to look at now. So here we go. This is what, what comes up next here. So this is very exciting. If you haven't seen this before. Whoa, look at this. It's kind of, kind of cool. <laughs> So we have the, at the very top there, you can see the contemplation of, uh, it should have said contemplation of body. That's a mistake there at the top. So this is a comparison of the various sources. Uh, yeah. So um, first of all, just to give you an idea what is meant by these various sources here. Uh, yeah. So you have here, you have uh, the Pali source at the very top top row is where we are now. We can see the Pali source is there. And then you have the Sarvastivadin version of the Sutta. The Sarvastivadin is found in Chinese translation in the present day. If you are to read the suttas in Chinese, the ancient Chinese, the Chinese that was translated almost 2000 years ago, this is what you would read. And you would read that Sarvastivadin version. Then we have the Ekayana Sutra. This is a sutra which maybe belongs to the uh, Mahasangika school. Uh, yeah? This is also a version of the Satipatthana Sutta. It's found in the Ekotra Agama, which is the equivalent of the Anguttara Nikaya. The Savastivadin Sutta is found in the Madhyama Agama, which is like the Majjhima Nikaya. Then we have the uh, Prajna pa Paramita Sutta. Uh, this is also found in Chinese language and, and Sanskrit as well. And uh, this is a, a Mahayana Sutta. But within that Mahayana Sutta, there is also Satipatthana, yeah, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, this is not such an important source, but it's still interesting just to compare it to the others. Yeah. And then the last three sources here are actually quite interesting because the last three here, they are... Abhidhamma sources. So the Vibhanga is the Pali Abhidhamma. What does the Pali Abhidhamma have to say about Satipatthana? Dharmaskanda is the Sarvastivadin Abhidhamma. What does the Sarvastivadin Abhidhamma have to say about Satipatthana? And the Sariputra Abhidharma is the Dharmaguptaka Abhidhamma. This is the Abhidhamma of the Dharmaguptaka school. And perhaps you wonder, why am I talking about Abhidhamma? I always say bad things about the Abhidhamma. I'm never too keen on the Abhidhamma because it goes too far into becoming a philosophy rather than becoming about Buddhism. And the reason why it is included here is because there are parts of the Abhidhamma that are very closely related to the suttas. There's a part of the Abhidhamma known as the uh, it is known as the Suttanta Bhajaneya, which means the analysis according to the suttas. And it's almost exactly what you find in the suttas. But what is interesting is what you find here is actually a little bit different from the suttas. And that makes it like a separate source. It is possible that the Abhidhamma, this part of the Abhidhamma was established 
before the Sutta, the Satipatthana Sutta started to change. Yeah? This could very well be a very early version of Satipatthana because, uh, uh, because of the nature, it takes time often for changes to take place. So for that reason, it's actually interesting here to look, in this case, it is interesting to look at the Abhidhamma, what the Abhidhamma has to say about this, uh, because it is an Abhidhamma that is close to the suttas. So these are the sources, yeah? So now let us see what they actually have in common. It's, it's a shame in a sense that we haven't got even more sources because it would have been interesting to kind of have even more sources. But unfortunately, this is all we have. Uh, remember that um, initially two and a half thousand or 2,200 years ago, there have been, may have been a vast amount of sources. Uh, all the various schools would have had their own version of Satipatthana. We could go back and compare all of these things. Uh, yeah? And that would have been very interesting. But now we are limited to a much smaller number. We have things in Pali, we have things in Sanskrit, we have things in Chinese translation, we have some things in Tibetan translation, and we have some things in various kind of Indian languages called Prakrits. And that is really what we have left. And that is what we're working with. Still, this fact that we have all of these different languages is almost like a revolution in Buddhism. This is an entirely new way to think about Buddhism. Because 150 years ago, uh, yeah, that is when this kind of investigation started. Uh, and even now, these kind of investigations are in their infancy, just really happening very quite recently. These things have never really been known about in Theravada Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism has always been very kind of centered on one country. Uh, people weren't aware that there were Chinese scriptures, Tibetan scriptures, Sanskrit scriptures, and all of these kind of things. Uh, that has only come to light more recently. Uh, and it's only now that we start to have this ability to compare the suttas in this way. And it gives us a lot of new information about the suttas. It was a fairly modern thing. Otherwise, maybe it sounds like I am incredibly conceited. Yeah, why should I know about the suttas? Why should I know, uh, you know more than anyone else? Well, it's not that I know more, but it's just that in the modern times, we have this additional information that actually is quite new and quite revolutionary in some ways. Let me just stop there. Let's have a quick meditation. Come back to the Sutta again, the Satipatthana Sutta. I will share my screen. So here we are. So, um, so here are then this table of all the various uh, schools, the Abhidhamma, the Suttas, and all of these kind of things. Uh, and it shows you which ones of these ways of doing Satipatthana are in common between all the schools, yeah? Wh which schools have the various exercises? Uh? So if you start with mindfulness of breathing, on the left side there, you can see the mindfulness of breathing. So you can see that the mindfulness of breathing is found in the Pali, yeah, the equal sign means that it is, exists in that collection. It is found in the Pali. It is found in the Sarvastivada, which is the Madhyama Agama in Chinese translation. It is found in the Prajna Paramita, which is a little bit of a side issue, but anyway. And it's also found in the Sariputra Abhidharma, which is the Abhidharma of the Dharmaguptaka school. Yeah? So if we take out the Prajna Paramita, which is a Mahayana text, you can see it is only found in half of the sources we have, only half the sources. It is not found in the Vibhanga, which is a Theravada Abhidharma text. It is not found in the Ekayana Sutra, which is the Mahasangika school, yeah, one of the great schools of ancient India, and nor is it found in the Dharmaskanda, which is another uh, Abhidhamma text of the Sarvastivan. It's only found in half the sources. Yeah? So what does that mean? Well, what it means, it means that mindfulness of breathing is unlikely to have been there as part of the earliest Satipatthana Sutta. Because if it was there from the very beginning, you would expect to find it in all the sources. Because no one would throw out the word of the Buddha. They might add something, but they don't normally throw things out. Because that is considered like sacrilegious, if you like, to use a Christian term. So, um, uh, yes, yeah, so that means that mindfulness of breathing is not part of body contemplation. That's kind of interesting, because how can that be? 
I was just saying before that mindfulness of breathing is the main way of practicing satipatthana. So how come it does not belong in body contemplation? That's kind of strange. Am I contradicting myself? And the answer is no, not really. Because uh, the problem is that when you have mindfulness of breathing in body contemplation, yeah, and then in the other contemplation, you don't have mindfulness of breathing because when we look at the other contemplations later on, the Vedana, this is, just, this is just the body here. When we look at the feelings, the mind and the Dhamma, there is no mention of breathing there. In those places, there's no mention of the breath. Yeah. So the impression you get when you read the Satipatthana Sutta is that breath meditation only belongs with the body. It does not belong with the other ones. But that is wrong. We know that that is wrong because when we come to the Anapanasati Sutta, the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, mindfulness of breathing fulfills all the four Satipatthanas. It goes all the way through. Yeah? And this is why it is misleading to have mindfulness of breathing under body contemplation because it gives you a sense that mindfulness of breathing is a very small thing. It only belongs to body contemplation, but it does not belong to the more advanced contemplation, the advanced contemplation of feeling, of mind, and of dhammas. So mindfulness of breathing, you might think, if you only read the Satipatthana Sutta, that it is a very limited and small thing. And then when you get more advanced, then you go to the feelings of the body. Yeah, this is a very common thing that we are taught in Theravada Buddhism. You go to the feelings of the body because mindfulness of breathing is finished. You do mindfulness of breathing the first few days of the retreat. Then you go to the feelings of the body. But I say that's the wrong way. I, I think that is a, not necessarily wrong, but it's actually not the main way that the Buddha talks about meditation practice. Mindfulness of breathing takes you all the way watching feelings in the body is never talked about the Buddha anywhere. Yeah, there is no reason why we should be just watching feelings in the body in a kind of general sense like that. So you can see here, once we start to change how we look at the sutta, it changes how we think about meditation practice. We think about meditation in a new way. We, we start to think, maybe I shouldn't be watching the feelings in the body in that way, because maybe the Buddha didn't really teach that. Later on, we will see when we come to the uh, mindfulness of the mind, the citta nupassana, contemplation of the mind, there are teachers in Theravada that talk about uh, just watching the mind all the time, yeah? And they call that mindfulness of the mind. But if we follow what I've been saying now, the real mindfulness of the mind, we shall see later on, actually also happens with the breath, because breath goes all the way through, yeah? So... Actually, mindfulness of breathing does not belong under body contemplation. And the reason is because it belongs under the whole of Satipatthana. It is the main way of practicing Satipatthana, doing Satipatthana practice. And we shall see this later on with much more clarity once we come to the mindfulness of breathing here. I hope you're able to follow me. I don't know if, if it is too complicated and too hard to follow not sure maybe it's a bad timing yeah straight after lunch and maybe i don't know if you have eaten too much or you had a good cup, cup of coffee or not but i realize that these things can be a bit uh, technical straight after lunch so please feel free to ask questions about these things and then i can try to explain this in more detail later on please don't be shy about holding back if you think your question is very like a beginner question or Maybe you think your question is a bit stupid. This is what everyone thinks. Oh, my question is a bit stupid. I'm afraid of asking. That's usually the thing that stops people from asking questions. But usually, in my experience, the stupid questions are usually really good questions. So don't be afraid. Don't hold back. Yeah. So that is the first one. Then we come to the second one, the four postures. And you see the case of the four postures is exactly the same as it is with the mindfulness of breathing. Only half the sources have the, have the four postures. If, that is, if we disregard the Prajna Paramita, which is in the uh, Mahayana tradition, then there's exactly three of each. So again, it looks like the four postures are not really part of Satipatthana practice. And this makes sense. Yeah? This is what I was discussing before at the beginning of this retreat. 
we were looking at the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta, the mindfulness directed to the body. And I was saying that the four postures actually are not really meditation. They are a preliminary practice leading up to meditation. They come before meditation practice. Yeah? And I made the point that it is very similar to situational awareness, the next one. It is about being aware of what you're doing, having mind mindfulness about what you're doing so as to overcome unnecessary defilements. It is what allows you to practice Satipatthana later on. It is not part of Satipatthana, it is what leads up to Satipatthana. And then the same thing for the situational awareness, the third one we have here on the column on the left. Again, only three of the sources have situational awareness, three don't, again, leaving out the Prajna Paramita. Yeah, so again, it doesn't really belong in the Satipatthana Sutta. And it, of course, it doesn't because it is not really about meditation. It is about understanding your postures in daily life, knowing whether you're doing the right thing, knowing whether you are giving rise to unnecessary defilements, having clear awareness about what is happening, the purpose, the suitability we were talking about last time. These are called the um, uh, Saattika, Saattaka and Sapaya uh, of uh, of, uh, of this uh, uh, Sampajanya, yeah? So again, it is a preliminary exercise. What we do that leads up to meditation practice. Uh, and in fact, this is exactly what we see in other suttas. Uh, in some suttas you have Sampajanya and you have Satipatthana in the same sutta. Sampajanya always comes first. Satipatthana comes further down later on. Uh, so again, it makes sense, yeah? We can see how things come together now, uh, how things sort of become really much more clear. So these first three ways of, uh, that are included in Satipatthana here probably do not belong in Satipatthana Sutta at all, uh, yeah? So now let's come to the part which may, may be part of Satipatthana. Now we come to the 31 parts of the body. And again, now, this is very interesting, every single one of the sources we have includes the 31 parts of the body. This must mean that the 31 parts of the body is very likely to have been an early, the earliest part of Satipatthana. If every source has it, it means that it must have been there from the beginning and it was inherited probably from the Buddha himself. Yeah? Remember these schools, they started separating 150 to 200 years after the Buddha. We're very, very close to the Buddha. So if all of these schools have this after separation, very likely this is what the Buddha taught. So this is the real body contemplation. You have the 31 parts of the body. This is where the Buddha was coming from. So why is that? How does this connect with the idea of mindfulness of breathing that I was talking about before, because I'm saying mindfulness of breathing is the main way of doing Satipatthana. And the way that it connects is that uh, if you do mindfulness of breathing, uh, but you have had problems with the meditation practice, uh, you have problems moving forward, going deeper in the meditation. Well, one of the things that you have to do is to do body contemplation to reduce your attachment to the body, the desire for the body, which includes the desire for the five senses, yeah? So this is like the one way of helping you to move forward in your mindfulness of breathing, yeah? This is why it is there. So there's two ways of doing the body contemplation, either the 31 parts of the body or the mindfulness of breathing. And sometimes you have to do both, so they support each other, not at the same time, of course, but you have to do both, alternating a little bit, and then there will, be, there will be a mutual support between these things. So that is the 31 parts of the body. Now let's look at the last two of these uh, exercises, if you like. Yeah. Then we have the four elements meditation. You remember the four elements from the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta. You can see here how every exercise is almost exactly the same. And what we find with the four elements is that all of the sources have it except for one. There's only one source that doesn't have the four elements. And that source is, you can't see it now because it has disappeared, but that source is the Vibhanga. Yeah, the Vibhanga is this source here. 
it's good. There you are, that's the Vibhanga for you. So um, the Vibhanga is a Theravada Abhidhamma text, yeah? So the Theravada Abhidhamma does not have the four elements. All the other sources have them. Huh? So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that the four elements is likely to be quite early because all the sources have them. Huh? But it is possible that in the very earliest period, these four elements did not exist. This could mean that the Vibhanga yeah, was actually something that was, uh, uh, was um, established in Theravada fairly early on. It's a fairly early text, quite possibly. Yeah. Anyway, it's hard to say. But so four elements is the second most likely part of the Kaya Nupassana. Second most likely to be part of this. 31 parts of the body is the most certain aspect of contemplation of the body. The second most uh, important, the second most likely to be original is the four elements, yeah? And this is why the four elements contemplation can be quite interesting and powerful because it leads again to this dispassion that allows you then to follow the breath and practice the breath meditation properly. Then we come to the charnel ground meditations, yeah? And in this case, there is only, there's two sources that don't have it the Vibhanga and the Dharmaskanda, two different uh, Abhidhamma texts, one belonging to Theravada, the other one belonging to Sarvasti Vada. All the others, they have the Charnel Ground meditations. So this is the third most likely to be original because it is found in uh, uh, more texts. But so what is the overall idea here? Well, the overall idea is that it is the 31 parts of the body we can be most sure of is the original Kaya Nupassana body contemplation. Then if we don't like that, well then we can maybe go to the four elements because it is the second most likely. That is really the kind of conclusion that we can draw from this kind of table. So keeping that in mind, now let us have a look at these exercises. We have had a look at them before, so we can have a fairly quick going through of all of these exercises now because we already know what actually is in there. So let's uh, see what comes. So here we have the mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, this is exactly the same as we saw before in the uh, Kaya Gata Sati Sutta. So I will just uh, read it out just for completeness. And then we can discuss this in detail when we come to the actual Anapanasati Sutta, the Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing. Yeah. And how does a mendicant meditate contemplating or observing an aspect of the body? It is when a mendicant gone to the wilderness or to the foot of a tree or to an empty hut, sits down cross-legged with a body straight and focuses their mindfulness right there. Just mindful, they breathe in. Mindful, they breathe out. When breathing in heavily, they know I am breathing in heavily. When breathing out heavily, they know I am breathing out heavily. When breathing in lightly, they know I am breathing in lightly. When breathing out lightly, they know I am breathing out lightly. They practice breathing in, experiencing the whole body. They practice breathing out, experiencing the whole body. They're practicing breathing in, stilling the body's motion. That's just the breath. They practice breathing out, stilling the body's motion. So uh, that is how the breath meditation is explained in connection with the body. Yeah? And each step here is more profound than the previous one. So as we move on in these steps, it becomes deeper and deeper in meditation, sharper and sharper mindfulness as we move on. I'll explain this in much more detail when we come to the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta. Then we have a simile. Oops. Let's have a look at this simile. It is like a deaf carpenter or a carpenter's apprentice. When making a deep cut, they know I am making a deep cut. And when making a shallow cut, they know I am making a shallow cut. So in other words, it's just about being aware. Yeah, you're just aware of what is going on. You don't try to make the deep cut. It doesn't say that you deliberately do it. Yeah, 
It is rather just the idea that you are, you know that you are making a deep cut. It's about knowing what is going on, not creating the deep breath or the shallow breath or the light breath or the heavy breath. That is already very useful information from that simile. Yeah? The idea that all you're doing is you are aware. You are aware of the depth. You don't make it deep. You don't make it shallow. This is kind of the important point here. And now comes a very interesting part of this sutta. This is very uh, specific to the Satipatthana Sutta. And this is like uh, uh, the um, kind of broader context in which we do Satipatthana practice. Uh, and this particular paragraph we come to now is found after each type of meditation, each kind of exercise, if you like, we find this paragraph every single time. Uh, so for that reason, it's a very important paragraph. So let's have a, have a look at this and see what it uh, has to say and analyze it a little bit. Uh, and so they meditate, observing an aspect of the body internally, externally, and both internally and externally. They meditate, observing the body as liable to originate, as liable to vanish, as liable to both originate and vanish. Or mindfulness is established that the body exists to the extent necessary for knowledge and mindfulness. They meditate independent, not grasping at anything in the world. So what is this all about? And uh, what this is all about is different ways in which we approach the meditation on the breath. Yeah? And as we go down uh, this uh, see these various sentences here, it's, it's like a sequence of different steps. The first one is the internal, external, both internal, external. As the meditation deepens, as you go deeper in this, then you have the origination vanishing and both originating and vanishing. And then it ends up with not grasping at anything in the world, which is the most profound part of this whole thing here. So the first part of this internal, external, and both internal and external, that is all about samatha practice. It is all about calming down. It's all about bringing the mind to samadhi. And you may wonder, how can we know that? It's not kind of obvious at all. And the way we know that is that there are other suttas that show when you practice in this way, internally, externally, and both internally, externally, the mind reaches samadhi as a consequence. That's what this shows you, yeah? So we know that this part is about attaining samadhi, making the mind peaceful. It's about samatha, calming down the mind and becoming peaceful in this way. So this is the, uh, the first part. Now, then you have the second part, originate, vanish, and both originate and vanish. Well, that is more like insight. It's more like seeing things according to reality. Yeah, So it makes sense that the second part should then come after samadhi. It's a deeper aspect of satipatthana practice. Yeah, It kind of makes sense. You can see how this is a sequentially, it's very significant. The, the very first part about internal, external, and both internal and external, that it leads to samadhi, that fits with how, some, how Satipatthana is explained everywhere in the suttas. So everywhere in the sutta is, is the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path that leads to samma samadhi, that leads to the jhanas. That is exactly what we're seeing here again. So that fits very well with that. Whereas the second part, to originate and vanish and originate and vanish, this is a not as obvious, yeah? This is only makes sense in the context of Satipatthana being a path that goes all the way to the end of the path, all the way to uh, becoming an Arahant. But this is actually not the so common in the suttas, yeah? This is not such a common part of the Satipatthana practice. So what is interesting then, when you, again, when you compare this particular passage in the various schools of Buddhism, we just saw before the various sources that we have, you find that the most common one, the one you find everywhere, is the internal, external, and both internal and external. Whereas the originate, vanish, and originate and vanish seems to be a slightly later addition because it only exists in some sources. So what we can conclude from that again is that 
Satipatthana is primarily a samadhi practice. The purpose is to bring the mind to samadhi. It is not really a vipassana practice as such. Well, actually, it is both, yeah, because samatha and vipassana always go together. So if it is a samadhi practice, it is also vipassana, because you cannot avoid seeing things clearly as you become more still in the mind. So they kind of they go together regardless. But the first one is more fundamental and a more basic way of understanding meditation. That is what leads you to samadhi, leads you to the stillness of the mind. So what does it mean internally here? Well, internally means that you are looking at your own breath. Yeah, you're practicing looking at your own breath. Externally means that you are looking at the breath of others. Both external and internally means that you are making a universal claim about all breaths, all breaths having a certain nature. It's a universal kind of way of thinking about the breath. So it's kind of strange, isn't it? What do you mean? Contemplate, observe the breath of someone else. How can you do that? Well, you can, maybe if you go on a retreat and the person next to you is breathing really, really heavily, well, we can, maybe you can observe the breath, but that can't be the point. That seems very strange. And this to me, again, is another pointer that uh, anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, does not really belong here. It doesn't really belong to the Satipatthana Sutta. Because how can you think about the breath of another person? It's kind of irrelevant. Yeah? You don't really observe the other person's breath in this way. Why would you want to do that anyway? It is not really all that helpful. Uh, and it fits much better when it comes to the 31 parts of the body. Because with the 31 parts of the body, your body is like this, other bodies are like that. You know that as a matter of, you can infer that because you know your own body, you know the bodies of others. So with the 31 parts of the body, internal, external makes good sense. With the breath, it makes much less sense. Of course, if you go to a Theravada retreat center, they will tell you why it makes sense, yeah? Because this is kind of what they are obliged to do. They are obliged to interpret this in a certain way. They don't have that kind of historical context to understand these things. And so they will give you an explanation. Uh, but usually the explanation is not really satisfactory. You wonder if it is not makes more sense to leave mindfulness of breathing out of this whole thing yeah that makes more sense anyway so that is the idea here yeah external internal then you have the origination and vanishing which really doesn't belong here either uh, but it is part of the deeper way of doing satipatthana perhaps doesn't really belong in the satipatthana sutta then you have that you are just mindful that the body exists yeah for the extent of knowledge and uh, uh, mindfulness, uh, and uh, it is a bit disputed uh, exactly uh, what that means. Uh, it, I guess it means that you have a degree of knowledge, a degree of mindfulness, uh, yeah, the extent necessary for knowledge and mindfulness, uh, uh, and you are aware of the breath, uh, and you are deepening this knowledge and mindfulness as you go along. Something like that is a little bit unclear. And then finally, as you come to the very end, uh, you meditate independently, not grasping at anything in the whole world. Uh, and that is when this process matures all the way to the deepest point. Uh, yeah? So starting from the very beginning, just observing, calming yourself down, developing samatha and vipassana, then after samadhi, then you can see the origination and vanishing of things, especially the body and in fact all the five khandhas. Uh, we saw from the previous sutta, the longer sutta of the elephant's footprint, how one aspect like the body actually includes all the five khandhas, uh, yeah, the entire experiential reality of body and mind. Uh, and then as you do that, you end up not grasping at anything in the world. Uh, so this is the, um, uh, this famous verse at the end, uh, and you find this at the end of every single exercise in Satipatthana. So it's kind of important to uh, understand roughly what it means. Uh, of the things here, the most important part by far, to make it very clear once again, is internally, externally, and both internally and externally. That seems to be the original part of Satipatthana, and it really is all about samadhi, but stilling the mind. That's really what it is concerned with. Uh, 
And uh, so it fits very well with the idea that Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, is the core part of Satipatthana practice. Okay, let's do a little bit more meditation. We have looked at the very first part of the Satipatthana Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing part. Now let us move on to the next part. And this is, as we have seen before, it is the four postures. So I'm gonna just read it out very briefly again. Uh, furthermore, uh, when a mendicant is walking, they know I am walking. When standing, they know I am standing. When sitting, they know I am sitting. When lying down, they know I am lying down. Whatever posture their body is in, they know it. And then you have the same refrain as we had before, uh, external, internal, origination and vanishing and all of that. And uh, so I don't, I'm not going to talk much more about this because I've talked about this at length already. And just to note again that it does not really belong here. It belongs to an earlier part of the path before meditation practice. Then we have situational awareness. Yeah. And this too belongs earlier on the path. So just for completeness, let me just uh, read it out one more time. Furthermore, a mendicant acts with situational awareness. Uh, about, about, remember I said about is a better translation, about going out and coming back, about looking ahead and aside, about bending and extending the limbs, about bearing the outer robe, bowl and robes, about eating, drinking, chewing and tasting, about urinating and defecating, about walking, standing, sitting, sleeping, waking, being awake, speaking and keeping silent. So you have clear awareness about all those things. You know what the appropriate amount is, when to do these things, etc., so as to align with the practice of the path. So you practice the path better. And in this way, they meditate uh, contemplating an aspect of the body internally, etc. That too is how a mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of the body. Now we come to the uh, uh, focusing on the repulsive. Yeah, this is the 31 parts of the body. And uh, uh, this again, we have been through already. So I will not uh, say too much, but because this is a critical part of Satipatthana, as I said, this is maybe probably the most early part of Satipatthana, the one that goes back to the time of the Buddha, very, very likely. Yeah, so uh, for this reason, it is particularly interesting here. So furthermore, a mendicant examines uh, or investigates, uh, yeah, or um, something like that, investigates, examines, contemplates uh, their own body up from the soles of the feet and down from the tips of the hairs, uh, wrapped in skin and full of many kinds of filth or impurities, if you like. Uh, in this body, there is head hair, body hair, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, undigested food, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, saliva, snot, synovial fluid, and urine. So 31 parts of the body, no brain is to be found. So whatever, it doesn't really matter. And then you have this beautiful simile that we saw before. It is as if there were a bag with openings at both ends, filled with various kinds of grains. Such is the fine rice, wheat, mung beans, peas, sesame, and ordinary rice. And someone with good eyesight were to open it and examine the contents. These grains are fine rice, these are wheat, these are mung bean, these are peas, these are sesame, these are ordinary rice. In the same way, you observe or you contemplate or you reflect on an aspect of the body internally, externally, both internally, externally, etc., etc. That too is how mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of the body here. 
So um, uh, when we discussed this last time, the question came up whether this was really a recommended practice for lay people. And it really depends on your commitment and depends on your situation, whether you are living in a relationship or singly and what your kind of commitment to the Dhamma is. And uh, if you're very, very committed, it can be maybe be useful sometimes. Uh, but remember that the main meditation of focusing on the body here, or all meditation throughout, uh, is actually the breath meditation. It is actually enough to do the breath meditation. If you find that you are really stuck or whatever, maybe you can do this as an additional thing, just to help you a little bit. Uh, but generally speaking, I would not recommend it because it is just not nice. Yeah, it is not, it doesn't really add quality to your life. Sometimes it detracts from the quality of life. And the purpose of the spiritual path is to make the quality of life better. That is why we're here. We want to be more happy. We don't want to suffer more. So be very careful with these kind of things. Otherwise, you may destroy the joy of meditation, the joy of the Buddhist path. It's supposed to be something pleasant, something that we all enjoy. Then it is heading in the right direction. And an important part of that is this idea here that what we are doing is we are not, uh, we are seeing this just like a bag, yeah, a bag full of various kinds of grain. And the grains, yeah, you see rice, you see mung beans, you see wheat. So it's more like a neutral way of just observing what is there. Yeah, you observe what is there. Okay, wheat is there. No one gets disgusted by seeing wheat. No one gets disgusted by seeing mung beans. You might get hungry, but you're not going to get disgusted with it. Yeah, so you see those things there. So it's like a neutral observation. It's just understanding that this is the nature of this. It is not to actually make you repelled or make you upset with your body and wanting to destroy yourself or anything like that. So remember this neutrality, neutrality of observing. So if you do this in the right way, it actually, all it leads to, it leads to a sense of being dispassionate, a sense of the reduction in attachment and desire. That is the purpose. The purpose is not to get disgusted with the body, anything like that. So keep that in mind. But because it is an early part of the Satipatthana Sutta, I think it's important to uh, at least consider it as a possible meditation object because it goes back to the Buddha. On the other hand, uh, it is also, I think, important to point out that it is not a very common thing found in the suttas. Uh, you don't find the 31 parts of the body in many places. It may be found in a handful of places in the suttas. Uh, so it's relatively rare, and as such, it is not considered anything tremendously important. Uh, breath meditation, by contrast, is found much more often. Breath meditation is a fundamental part uh, of the, the, the path, uh, whereas this is not fundamental to quite uh, the same way. Uh, yeah, I maybe, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, in many ways, I think the four elements meditation is at least as important in the suttas as the 31 parts of the body. And because it is um, as important, because it's found in many places, even though it may not have been part of the early Satipatthana Sutta, it is still an important meditation that is worthwhile doing, focusing on the elements. So, so let's have a quick look at the elements now. So furthermore, a mendicant examines their own body whatever its placement or posture, according to the elements. In this body, there is the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. It is as if a deft butcher or a butcher's apprentice were to kill a cow and sit down at the crossroads with the meat cut into portions. Earth over here, this is kind of the hard parts, the bones or whatever. And you have the water over here, this is like the I don't know, urine or whatever. Then you have the air over here, this is the breath. And then you have the fire over here, this is like the heat of the body into kind of nice little piles. And you see it all kind of piled up in this way here. And we have already looked at this in great detail in the Greater Sutta on the elephant's footprint. So I'm not going to talk about it more here, but just to say that it is a uh, it is an interesting meditation object because it seems to be fairly early. It's certainly part of the suttas elsewhere. 
So you meditate, observing the body internally, externally, all of this, and that too is how mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of the body. Let's move on. I'm going a bit faster now because uh, we have seen all of this before. Uh, we come to the charnel ground uh, contemplations, and these are a little bit more obscure again. Uh, they occur only in four out of the six main sources for the Satipatthana Sutta, so not as important as the previous ones, uh, the two previous ones. Uh, and in the overall view of the suttas, they're actually very rare. They're not very important at all. Uh, so uh, it is something that uh, it is really only for people with special interest that I would recommend these kind of contemplation. Still, let's just read through it once more because it is here. It is in front of us, so we might as well read through it. Uh, that's kind of my idea anyway. So let's just have a look, have a look at it. Uh, so furthermore, suppose a mendicant were to see a corpse uh, discarded in a charnel ground. Uh, and it had been dead for one, two, or three days, bloated, livid, and festering. They would compare it with their own body. This body of mine is also of the same nature. It is the same kind. It has not gone beyond that kind of state. That too is how a mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of the body. Furthermore, suppose they were to see a corpse discarded in a charnel ground, being devoured by crows, hawks, vultures, herons, dogs, tigers, leopards, jackals, and many kinds of little creatures, like worms and all kinds of things, and what have you. They would compare it with their own body. This body is also of that same nature, that same kind. It has not gone beyond that state, that reality. That too is how a mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of the body. Furthermore, suppose they were to see a corpse discarded in a charnel ground, a skeleton with flesh and blood held together by sinews, a skeleton without flesh but smeared with blood and held together by sinews, a skeleton rid of flesh and blood held together by sinews. Bones rid of sinews, scattered in every direction. Here a hand bone, there a foot bone. Here a shin bone, there a thigh bone. Here a hip bone, there a rib bone. Here a back bone, there an arm bone. Here a neck bone, there a jaw bone. Here a tooth, there a skull. And then white bones, the color of shells. Yeah, when you see old bones, you know what they look like. Yeah? Decrepit bones heaped in a pile, bones rotted and crumbled to powder. In that way, they would compare their own body to that. This body, it also of that same nature, the same kind, and has not gone beyond that state. And then you have the summary, the kind of uh, uh, various kind of contemplations again there. And so they meditate, observing an aspect of the body internally, externally, and both internally and externally. Yeah. Yeah. This, here this makes sense because you can relate this idea of the skeleton and the corpse, you can relate that to yourself and to other people. It's the same idea. All bodies are ultimately the same. They meditate, observing a body as liable to originate, to vanish, and both to originate and vanish. That kind of also makes sense in this context, yeah, the vanishing of the body, the disappearance of all of these uh, various aspects here, and then the origination when you get reborn. Uh, and then the mindfulness or the mindfulness is established uh, that the body exists uh, to that extent necessary for knowledge and mindfulness. Uh, they meditate independent, not grasping at anything in the world. Uh, that too is how a mendicant uh, meditates by observing an aspect of the body. So that is the end of the Kaya Nupasana, yeah, the contemplation of the body. And uh, uh, I have gone through this very quickly because uh, we have already seen all of this through the contemplation of the body before, when we did the Kaya Gatha Sati Sutta, the mindfulness directed towards the body. So if you want to listen to that again to get a more clear idea, please do so. 
But now we come to new material. What comes up next is a contemplation of feeling, and we have not 